Hello and uh, welcome to this video. We're going to uh, continue on uh, where we previously left off, essentially. Uh, with the previous video I made on uh, Python C extensions. If you haven't seen that, you should probably check it out. Uh, but yeah, the what we're going to look at in this video is uh, uh, NumPy. Like, how can we interact with NumPy arrays from a C extension? Which is probably the most one of the most compelling use cases for writing C extensions is for interacting with uh, NumPy uh, because that then often you have a lot of data and you want to do some kind of uh, operation on that really quickly and uh, looping through that in Python is going to be quite slow. Typically, you can see performance improvements up to 100 uh, x or more by write writing these uh, C extensions compared to just doing the looping in in Python itself. Uh, I mean, if you if you can, you should probably use the built-in functions in NumPy or uh, SciPy or different libraries like this. You will save a lot of time and uh, potential uh, pain compared to doing it yourself. But uh, still, we're going to look into doing this and I guess the useful starting point is to try to take the sum of all the elements in the NumPy array. This is obviously something that's built into NumPy itself but we will implement it just to see what uh, what it looks like to get familiar with the uh, uh, like how you interact with uh, NumPy. And then having a very simple problem I think is advantageous for that because then the main focus is on how NumPy works and not on the problem itself. The You might remember this uh, C extension, as I mentioned from the previous video, which we built using GCC. You can also do this with uh, setup tools instead of invoking the compiler directly. Using setup tools is probably more portable across uh, operating systems. But for the purpose of this video, I'm just going to keep using GCC directly because it I feel maybe gives uh, some more under the hood uh, understanding of how things uh, work. Maybe I'll dive into how to set this up with uh, setup tools in a different video, but it's quite simple. Um, yeah, so you might remember we can build our C extension by just running this command, which then allows us to import this .so file as if it was a .py file like this. And you can see it prints hello world because we have this uh, printf in our initialization uh, method. Alright, so that's uh, fairly simple. So you can see we include python.h here and uh, this uh, include statement here is what allows us to find that uh, header file. I guess the next step is trying to include uh, numpy. What you typically do then is include numpy array object dot h. We can try to recompile it, and we can see it's uh, uh, not uh, that uh, simple uh, when you use uh, GC. You can't just recompile it. You also need to specify what is the include directory of of numpy. So let's try to find out uh, what this is. We can do import numpy and numpy dot get include. Like so, and then you get the include path for for NumPy here. And that means we can rerun our compilation step, but uh, we now add another include flag, which is NumPy. And you can see we're getting a bit uh, further here. There's a new error message. First of all, it's saying uh, using deprecated NumPy API disable with this thing. So I guess we can then uh, put this. Uh, define flag at the top of our file to get rid of that uh, warning and there's a different thing here which is actually preventing the compilation which is an error and not a warning relocation against undefined symbol cannot, cannot be used when making a shared object so we need to recompile with this flag as well position independent code is what the PIC uh, letters uh, represent and now we can see it uh, successfully compiled and we have this .so file. 
So now we can start the Python interpreter. We can do import abc123. And we can see that it successfully imports. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a good start. Uh, I guess the next step here is to try to create a new new method here, the one we talked about, where we try to sum up all of the objects. So let's name it sum. And uh, we have the same type signature. If you want to have keyword arguments, you would have a third argument here as well, which is quarks. But uh, otherwise everything has the same type signature. Sometimes you might see from the documentation that they will write uh, static in front of the methods here. This just uh, like says whether these symbols, like sum in this case, is hidden or not uh, inside of the shared object. So it doesn't really impact uh, anything during the like normal usage. Add here, it won't be hidden. So it's like a global symbol in, inside of the shared object. But yeah, so it doesn't really matter that much with this uh, static thing. I guess the only thing that doesn't have static here is the pymod init func. Like this is the only thing that's like usually exposed if you just uh, do it the way that the documentation suggests. Anyways, now that we created this uh, method, which currently isn't doing anything, we can also add it to our method table. Sum, sum, and uh, we take uh, var args, sum, calculate sum of numpy array. And we can try to uh, recompile it. So far, so good. No uh, compiler warnings. And uh, yeah, so far we don't have anything inside of here yet. So we need to actually uh, take in some kind of arguments. So this is uh, like, you will see most of the numpy operations. They will start with pi array and then, for example, object or pi array object like this. Uh, like typically you have just pi object star like this. But this is, you could say, a more specialized version of a generic Python object, which represents a NumPy array. We can use uh, parse tuple, just as in our add function here, and give it args. And since we want to get the Python object this time, we just write O, and there's only a single argument. Uh, ar or array. So this should be uh, should be fine now. So one note there is that obviously this parse tuple function it can fail. So what happens if it fails? C doesn't have exceptions. Uh, like there's no try catch or anything you need to handle this uh, manually. And in some cases functions will return a status code in C, and uh, you have to check the status code and like did this fail or not. Otherwise, it just keeps running as you see it in sequence. Uh, in Python's case, we use a kind of global error flag that uh, a function can set after uh, after running, uh, and then you can check that to see if an exception occurred while we were running this uh, method. And to check that whether there something has gone wrong, we can do pi error occurred, this will check this uh, global flag. And if that, uh, if there was some error, we can then return null. Python will complain if you return something other than null, if the exception flag is also set. So now we have a function which can take in uh, an, a single argument, which is a Python object. And uh, so far, we haven't validated whether this is a, a, like a number or a string or a numpy array. We haven't said anything about that yet. We haven't uh, validated it. And you can see this is going to potentially lead to some, uh, some nice uh, seg faults uh, down the line here. 
Um, yeah, we can try to. So let's assume that our array is only float 64 or doubles. Uh, and then we want to get access to the data. So we can do pi array data of our array. And uh, we want to have the size as well, probably. We can do like this. The size thing is basically like doing length of array inside of uh, uh, inside of regular Python. Now, uh, let's say we want to have calculate some total here, which is uh, sum start at zero, and then we do a loop here, loop through all of the elements in the array. Total plus equals data i, and then we're going to return total. This is our, you could say, uh, sum function here. You can see there's a red line underneath there. You can't really return a double when you're supposed to return a pi object uh, pointer. So we can do pi float from double, and then give it total here. This should uh, create the Python object around uh, our number which allows us to, to return it. Since Python, uh, in Python everything is an object, you can't have like a bare bone number and do anything with that in Python. Everything has to be wrapped in, uh, in an object. Okay, so that uh, should be a good start if we try to compile it now. So far so good. And we can uh, try to use this now. So import abc123 and import numpy as mp. You can see it prints a hello world, so far so good. And then we do abc123.sum and we give it some numpy array of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 or 0 0.5. This should give us uh, 1.0 as the result, but instead we get the seg fault. <laughs> and uh, the reason we get the seg fault is not at all obvious, but we actually need to initialize numpy inside of the C extension. And this happens needs to happen inside of here after the module has been created. So you create the module and return it. So far this is the uh, exact same thing, just spread out on multiple lines. But here comes the important part, import array. So this will initialize numpy. Uh, and uh, that should uh, probably get rid of that seg fault for us. We can try to recompile it. And we do import abc123, import numpy, smp. And then we can do abc123.sum, maybe even copy paste just to see that we actually do the exact same thing. And you can see this time we actually got 1.0 instead of the seg fault. Okay, so let's try to have some fun here. What happens if we do 1, 2, 3 as integers instead? Now we get some kind of messed up result here. And the reason for that is that this uh, like, now we're interpreting integers as if they were doubles inside of this data here. Because the, you know, C code, like there's just bytes laying around there and we're choosing how we want to interpret it here. And uh, NumPy stores integers. We say, okay, we're gonna read these integers as if they were floats and then we get some crazy, crazy results. Another thing worth noting, if we want to test out this logic here, we can try to pass an extra argument. And you can see we actually get the type error. Function takes exactly one argument to a given. This is because we pass the second argument here. It will hit this error condition, return null. Uh, because this parse tuple, it will set the type error. Same thing if we pass zero arguments, we also hit the same thing. Okay, but this will, like since anything in Python is an object, 
we could also pass a number here, like one. One is also an object in in Python, so this should uh, should work fine. The problem here is that when we call PyArray data, it's gonna expect that we gave it a numpy array, but instead we gave it uh, an object with a number inside, and that's going to be kind of fun. As you can see, it causes a seg fault. Uh, so probably to protect against seg faults here, we we might want to do some uh, validation. We can do pi array check and then pass it r. And this is going to if uh, if r here is not a uh, numpy array, this one is going to to give us false. So it means we will go inside of this condition here if if uh, this is not a numpy array. And then we can set uh, pi exception or pi add set string and then we do pi probably a type error makes sense here and we can say uh, argument must be a numpy array we return null so this is how you would uh, essentially throw an error or erase an exception in uh, in python from a c extension uh, first you set this uh, error indicator and you return null. You can see that here we just return null because the uh, error indicator was already set by the parse tuple uh, thing from failing previously. So now if we if we try to rerun this, first you compile and then import abc123, abc123.sum, and if we give it the number now, you can see instead of seg faulting, we get the type error, which is <laughs> probably preferable in most cases. So that makes the function a bit uh, safer to to use. We still have the problem though that if we give a numpy array here, import numpy smp. If we give a numpy array of uh, of integers it's gonna kind of uh, choke on that uh, or like give some unexpected result because it's uh, it's interpreting the data in the wrong way so how can we deal with that how can we prevent this from happening there's a couple of ways we can uh, restrict our function so that it only accepts numpy arrays of the a certain data type and the uh, rejects it otherwise. So we can do then uh, another check here. We can do if pi array type of r not equal to numpy double. Then you can see that if we now try to pass the same array we should uh, hit this error condition. So we can test that out. Recompile and import numpy, import abc123. Yeah, now you can see we hit the type error here because it's not a, uh, like this numpy array is not of type double. What we can do though is we can do as type double and you can see we get the correct result, because it's casting a thing. Alternatively, just supply it dtype equals double, like so. Should also work. So that's uh, probably the easiest way, is to just like throw an error if you get the wrong type. But if you want to allow integers as well, like you want to be a bit more polymorphic, or uh, like accepting of different kinds of inputs there is actually a kind of useful function we can use instead of doing this pi array data directly because there's also other issues with the pi array data thing here uh, like if you have an array which is not contiguous what does that mean if we take some array and we do dot flags we can see some uh, properties that the numpy array has. You, you can see the C contiguous. This means our things next to each other uh, 
like in memory, if you consider it from a C perspective. And then this is Fortran, like uh, because you have C uses uh, row orders uh, on multi-dimensional arrays. Fortran uses columns. If you have one-dimensional arrays, typically it will be both like C contiguous and the uh, Fortran contiguous. Things will be like uh, in the same uh, same order. But uh, a problem here is that, let's say we take a, a slicer where we take every other element, like so, and we check flags. You can see now it is not C contiguous or Fortran contiguous because it doesn't actually create a copy of the array, it just creates a different way to index it, which means it's more performant, but you get this kind of thing. So what happens if we then do our something here and we pass it a non-contiguous array, this one in particular. Uh, yeah, we also need to have doubles, of course. But yeah, you can see that what we were expecting to get as a result here. Um, if we add this uh, thing, you can see we were expecting to get 4 as a result, but instead we got 3. And the reason for that is the size parameter here, it was set to 2, and the data here was set to 1, 2, 3. So it just t took the sum of the first two, because it was not contiguous uh, in memory. It means that it actually had to skip this uh, second element to do it, uh, or to do this correctly. So this is also another check we could add here, is that we could also say that pi array is C contiguous. So if that's not the case, must be a C contiguous numpy array of D type double. This is possible, then you can essentially validate this, which means that uh, if we try to recompile it, start it again, and uh, import numpy, import a, B, C, 1, 2, 3. And let's try to run this again. Now you can see that we, we fail on this because the contiguous flag is, uh, is not set. But what if we want to actually like not have to think about this and not have to run into these uh, walls? So there's a way, there's a function called uh, Pi array as C array, which is very useful, which we can use instead of this uh, data thing. And the way it works is that uh, the first argument is going to be reference to our array. Second argument is going to be where we want the output data to end up, and then we have some more arguments here, which we're gonna have to fill out. Dims here, uh, it's going to be what is the size in each dimension, and the is number of dimensions, and description uh, contains type information, like what kind of type information we want. So, well, it actually is more than just the type integer, it actually needs to be a description object, but you can do pi desker, uh, pi array desker, I think. Desker from type, and then we can do numpy double, for example. Number of dimensions is one, and the dimensions here Uh, looks like this. So the number of elements here is going to then uh, uh, match the dimensions. And we, we say that the dimensions is just the size of the array. That's the zeroth index. If it was a two-dimensional uh, 
array, we would need to have one here as well, and maybe set this to 10. So then it would be like size times 10 in terms of dimensions. But we only have uh, a single dimension in this case, uh, and uh, of uh, yeah, of length uh, size. This is going to be interpreted as doubles. So this needs to match what uh, whatever we have here. And the result of this is that we can now probably remove the check for whether the array is C contiguous and for whether the type is double, because now it should work with integers and non contiguous arrays as well as inputs. That said, we do need to check if this happened uh, successfully, because let's say we put the string as input, then this uh, method here is going to fail because it can't successfully cast to, to double. So you need to check the global flag here. And if some kind of error occurred, just going to return null here. Okay, that should be uh, pretty much it. So if we recompile it, we can probably move the text saying it needs to be contiguous and that it needs to be type double. Let's just say numeric. Recompile. Yeah, so import numpy as mp, import abc123, and if we do abc123.sum, yeah, this one, you can see it successfully now manages to do 1 plus 3 instead, and we get 4.0. And if this is not a uh, double, still we, it manages to interpret it uh, correctly. As you can see here, 1 plus 2 plus 3 is uh, 6.0. Uh, so you can see this pi array as c array was really useful for being much more accepting in terms of uh, the input we want to take. And from my understanding of it, this pi array as c array, it actually doesn't copy any memory either. It just uh, uh, somehow magically costs things uh, when you access them. It kind of uh, pretends to be a c array, and then when you access it, it uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit magic. I haven't uh, gotten a good enough uh, understanding of how this works yet. I guess I would need to read the source code. But yeah, that's uh, probably a good uh, good start here, good starting point. Uh, one more thing that is useful to know is how to create uh, an array. Let's say we want to create a new new function here, a new method, which will simply double all of the elements in an array. This is probably also a nice uh, nice thing to do. So we can uh, create a copy of this uh, this function, and uh, let's call it uh, double. Double elements in numpy array. Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> kind of a naming uh, conflict here as well, so let's just do uh, numpy double, like so. And then, likewise, we take in a single numeric array, this code can remain the same, same with this that uh, parses our array. I guess only the final code here is what's going to going to change. We're also going to need to, instead of returning a single number here, we're going to return a result array. So, pi array simple new is a nice function here. And you can see that it takes in this uh, number of dimension thing. It also takes in uh, dimensions. This is going to be the same as the one we used here, so we can just reuse the variable. And lastly, type num. 
So we don't need to deal with the entire desk screw from type thing here. We can just type numpy double directly. And you can see this is going to return uh, a new pi array object. Or in this case, we're just going to say pi object. We can do this as well, but just to show that we can do this, we we're going to do that. And uh, return result. And what's nice now is that we know that result is uh, C contiguous, and we know that it's uh, double. So that means we can actually do double uh, result data is equal to pi array data result. We also have our size from here, which is going to be the same here, because we use the same dims object. So that should mean that we can now do essentially the same for a loop. And we can do result data i is equal to 2 times data i. And let's try to compile this. Yeah, so this is something you see uh, that uh, I guess this uh, this name here should maybe change. Double array. Let's try that. So we got rid of that, and then there's also we need to cast here to pi array object. What else? That was it. Cool. Let's see if it works. Import numpy smp, import abc123, abc123 dot double, and to numpy array one two three and you can see now it actually creates a new numpy array which is double of the one we passed in you can see it uh, ends up being a, a double type here even though these were integers because we're saying that it always returns the same uh, d type i guess it's possible to have uh, different uh, logic based on the input type here. Uh, if you want to do that you can branch on uh, uh, numpy type. You can say if it's like an integer type then use separate logic for that and return a different type of array. But this is probably probably fine for, for this purpose. What you can see though is that uh, yeah I guess we can combine double with, with sum now. Just to show that you can combine multiple uh, functions like this. And then we get 2 plus 4 plus 6.4 is 12.4. Yeah. So now I've shown you quite a few things. I've shown you how to parse a numpy array as an input to a uh, C extension. How to throw uh, errors from C extension. How to uh, essentially uh, deal with the all of the different uh, flags you can have, whether it's contiguous or the input type. Like, it can be s lots of different uh, input types. And having to, well, being able to do that in a polymorphic way is nice. So you can use this pi array as array for that. I've also shown you how to create a new numpy array using this pi array simple new, where it's a bit safer to use uh, pi array data to access the underlying data directly, because you know the type and how long it is and the way you created it, you can make sure that uh, uh, make sure that it's gonna work correctly. That said, let's say you had the out of memory error. You probably want to check after this allocation whether there was an error and if there was return null. Because 
anytime you allocate new memory in C, you can have an out of memory or a memory error, which means that uh, if you want to handle that gracefully, uh, by not uh, seg faulting, let's say, you should uh, you should check this uh, error flag afterwards and return null. What I didn't show you uh, in this video is uh, reference counting in Python. That's a huge other topic. Like how do you avoid uh, memory leaks? Because uh, in these C extensions, you need to do the reference counting manually. I think in the code I showed there so far, there's actually not going to be any leaks. There's no memory that needs to be cleaned up, most likely. Uh, but you would uh, use uh, py, decref, and uh, things like this to to make sure that uh, things are cleaned up. Yeah, this is probably a bit of a long video already, so I think I'll uh, stop it here, and I might make uh, more videos on this uh, in the future. So stay tuned uh, for that.